today we're going to review a lot of the stuff that we did in PCHEM 1 uh, about color systems, and then we'll talk about forensic photography. So this is, um, again, dealing with color, since color is one of the most uh, important factors when we discriminate between evidence. So if we have, you know, uh, like next week when we talk about fibers, uh, Dr. Lewis, she's going to be talking about discriminating between different factors and uh, uh, different fibers that you find. So you have a, a fiber at the scene, you have a fiber on the clothing of a suspect. Are these the same fiber? She had some really challenging fibers that came from automotive carpets where all of these different brands of, uh, of automobiles have black carpet and it all looks the same. And, and yet she was able to discriminate like between 90% of them. So pretty, pretty good. And she got into the UV region of the spectrum and that'll be next Thursday, not this coming Thursday. So we're going to be talking about what is color? Color is perceived, of course, you know, with these names like this. I, I always hate the word puce. That's a, that's a color name, but it just sounds so bad. I mean, what even is that? You know, so color names are strange. Chartreuse. What is chartreuse? Yeah. I mean, I really don't know. What is it? Is it like that laser yellow color what is it you know what chartreuse is is it that hmm? I think it's like a warmer, yellow. warmer yellow yeah and see we use these words like warmer yellow that's supposed to mean something i agree with you it's supposed to mean something but wouldn't it be nice to have some numbers right you know it's chartreuse is maybe a, a, a 75 here but but it it's you know yeah okay there you go yeah <laughs> yeah so like i said the laser yellow <laughs> yeah yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's the name of what? Oh, okay. Interesting. I didn't know that. That's cool. And so then, quantitative color systems. So we'll talk about that a lot. But, but. <laughs> so now you know. Yeah. And so then we have these different colorants that we add to things, whether it be inks and toner and paint and so on. So the the. Perception of color is a learned behavior. You know, you you look it up. You 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 know, your parents teach you their colors. And I, you know, I was as a scientist looking at this, saying, I know color is learned. So what if I teach my kid that green is really red and blue is really purple and all of that? Because you could totally do that. Yeah, then that, that definitely that's abuse. Like, but <laughs> but I had these thoughts because I thought, you know, that's it's just names. You just put the names on there. That's right. That or also even yeah, red and green, um, driving past the stoplights. And, uh, yeah, and then uh, but also elementary school. You know, pick up the red block, and he picks up this. You know, <clears throat> but yeah, it's 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 just agreed upon. You know, we agree on or agree that these are the names for the colors. Um, exceptions agreed upon, like wedding and kitchen paint and so on. And so, uh, now there is actually a difference. Uh, I can't find the article, but it was it was talking about the the number and types of um, pigments that you have in your eye, and that there is a, a, a difference in the in the um, you know females and males in terms of the different types of pigments. So there really is a different perception of color. Like there's a biological reason why I can't see as many nuances of color that my wife can see. You know, so I I say these are the same, and she said they are not the same, and we're both telling the truth from our perception. I cannot perceive the difference in this. And she says, I can. So I need to find the paper because otherwise it's just my word. You know, so <laughs> I can find the paper. So uh, early on, they wanted to sort of uh, do this color matching. And so the, this Pantone formula was uh, one of the first sort of standardized things. This in 1962 is a manufacturer of color cards for cosmetic companies. So you see like all of those shades of pink. You know, they're going to have different Pantone numbers. So you sometimes will come across a Pantone color scale. And so it'll be a Pantone color system uh, number associated with a particular color. So just be on the lookout for that if you have uh, evidence and they um, they describe it using the Pantone system. It's a, it's a company. They made this uh, formulation guide that you can see there's, there's thousands of colors. We actually, at Pantex, when I was trying to quantify color for Pantex, uh, we had these Pantone color systems, and you can buy this binder, and it was about that thick because it had plastic cards in it, all dyed to the perfect, you know, Pantone color for that particular designation. And so you could compare it to these things, and, and you could say, like, this little orange, see that? Those are different oranges, right? 
And so you can find the Pantone system color for that and, and, and log it by taking your little plastic chips and comparing it to things. Uh, but I like the, the more spectrophotometry method going through the, sim, the spectroscopy that we did in PCHEM-1, where you have this uh, 1931 commission, the first uh, effort, I think, to, to uh, quantify color. And they came up with these uh, three parts to color perception. They talked about the standard illumination, the standard observer, and then the, the standard sample and observation geometry. And it gives numerical data. So there's there's a numerical standard for the lighting source profiles, the pigment functions, and the color spaces. And we're going to talk about those all today. Uh, these are some solutions that I made up in class uh, in my lab. Actually, um, this is methyl red. I'll try to find my pen. Where is it? Oops. Let's go back. Okay. So this is a like a pH indicator, methyl red. You know, I had to write this down. I'm just telling you what these are. This was nickel chloride. Uh, what was the blue? Copper sulfate. And what do you think the purple one was? Yeah. Most common purple. Yeah, potassium permanganate. Good job. So y'all know that bright purple solution. So we're going to talk about the purple one today. <clears throat> and then the water was my standard. And so these are the illuminants. These are the, the numerical values for the different sources of light. And you can see they have a different character to them. Um, how many people still have access to what an a incandescent bulb looks like? Like, do you have incandescent bulbs in your house? These are the ones that have the little uh, filament. Do y'all know the difference? Yeah, so you've seen, they look yellow, don't they? Yeah, and so this is the aluminum A here. This is an incandescent bulb. It looks very yellow, because here we have, you know, yellow, orange, red. This part of the spectrum, that's where, that's where the light is. This, if we kept going into the infrared, it would maxima, it would hit a maximum and come back down, and it's the black body profile So black body radiation with like a like a three thousand Kelvin. Let's get rid of that one. So if you have a black body an incandescent bulb is a is a hot wire. So it's it actually matches that Planck distribution, that black body distribution of light. And it only gets into the visible spectrum a little bit. It's mostly the maximum is down in the infrared. That's another thing. Those lights are inefficient. Only about 4% of the energy coming out of that light is in the visible region. It's giving off a lot of heat. It's giving off a lot of uh, you know, energy in the infrared. But very little of it is in the visible region. So only about 4% uh, of the energy going into that bulb is given off in the visible region. So it's not a great light bulb. So when people say, oh, we need to get rid of them, you know, I don't like government stepping in and banning stuff, um, but they are right in terms of it being inefficient. So we can improve things. Notice these others have numbers too. So these are our fluorescent profiles. So these are fluorescent lights, typically. <clears throat> they will have... Um, a lot of times they're mercury vapor, just similar to these lights, that produce a, a red, a green, and a, a blue photon. So there's an atomic emission going on, and those typically have really narrow lines. And so how do we get such an even profile? The, the coating on the inside of the glass of that tube will then fluoresce. So it'll absorb, say, the blue photon, and then emit in the green and the red and smear that light out. And so they put a lot of fluorescent compounds in that powder most of it's titanium dioxide, but then they'll dope in some other other elements and they'll produce a, a nice broad spectrum of light. Now, where this maximum is, like say it might be here. So if this is the rough maximum, this is real bumpy. It is not a black body curve at all because it's got all this fluorescent uh, material in it. But if the, 
this is the maximum, they compare it to a black body. So a nice smooth black body at 5,000 Kelvin would look like this. And so since it has a similar maximum, they call it D50, which is really 50 is like 5,000 Kelvin. And notice this, uh, this dashed one here is 6,500. So it has a maximum that's even more in the blue 6,500 Kelvin. So a D65 would be 6,500 Kelvin. That's, again, giving a lot of light in the visible spectrum, and they call that the daylight bulb because that's matching what the sun's giving us quite a bit. So so the sun is a nice, really hot, okay? It's giving lots of uh, light in the visible spectrum, and our light bulbs that would match a black body radiator at about 6,500 Kelvin uh, would give that same kind of light. The higher that color temperature, then the bluer the light. And so you can really see some of those bulbs look blue, some of those look yellow, the cooler ones are yellow. So that's the standard illumination area. So we have um, <clears throat> the standard illumination. We can, we can put one of those standard, like a D65 here. Uh, that would be that 6,500 Kelvin thing, and we're we're hitting this um, this screen over here with our with our sample on it. Now, what we do typically is we'll have a, a white screen, and we might have a colored object here. So, if we want to test a colored object, we swapped out that white piece with a colored object. And then we have a white screen on up here. If you ever have to produce your own white screen, I don't know if you'd ever need to, but barium sulfate. So you get some barium sulfate. It's super reflective, super white, and you can make that slurry and then mix it up with a little bit of, of uh, clear adhesive and let it stick to a, you know, a sample or, you know, some sort of uh, flat area. And that white rough surface of barium sulfate would be like the perfect white standard. So you can make your own standard there. You want the black standard then you would use carbon black you can buy pigment um, you can buy toner in a box essentially and use that in super black so we have standard illumination down here at the bottom we have our sample geometry and then we have this uh, masking screen that keeps it in the center of the eye where you have the color viewing area of the retinas so then when we talk about the two degree obser observation there's a two degree and a ten degree and so where your head is, where the screen is, what you're viewing, all of that is controlled because they want to standardize it. So this is how the initial 1931 standard color system came about. Now, how do we get the, the color of this colored object? So we have the colored object here. It's being hit with a standard illumination. We can take that standard illumination and run it through a monochromator, or we can have red, green, and blue filters. So we have these red, green, and blue filters here, and we can turn on the lights at, you know, different strengths. So we can have three knobs. We can have a RGB knob. We turn on the R until it's too red, we turn it back. Turn on the green until it's too green, and turn it back in the blue. So by your hand, you're using your eyes as the detector. And so you're adjusting the RGB until the top and the bottom look the same color. So you have the bottom as the question object, the top is your RGB values, you're adjusting the top. When they are perceived to be the same, then you stop. And, and in fact, you could do sort of an error analysis. You could, you could turn the blue up until it's different and come back down and so you've got the highest blue value. You could turn the blue down until it's different and stop and come back. And then you got the lowest blue value and you could do that for R, G, and B and you could produce sort of an error box around those three um, values. So it's a really great system. Uh, it's pretty intense in terms of the setup, but you know, you could imagine you have your head in a little, you know, little holder and you've got the screen and you've got the holes and you've got the knobs and all of that stuff. Um, you could actually move, uh, you know, and remove those three filters and just put a monochromator and a white source and, and turn the wavelength. You can crank the wavelength along and you could see when you hit that color. 
So if we do that by wavelength and we match red and green and blue, we can, we can actually um, test your eye pigment responses. And so we can put a particular monochromator on there and we can adjust the red, green, and blue values. And so that's what's going on in, in mapping out the uh, observer functions. So this, um, we, we saw the setup, you saw the standard illumination, um, and then what we can do is we can map out these observer functions. So if we set that bottom light up at say 400 uh, nanometers, then the green knob is all the way at zero. The red knob is a tiny a bit higher and the blue knob is even more, okay? Then we move over to say 450. Now the green knob is a little bit off of zero. The red knobs, you know, turned on quite a bit and the blue of course is the major number. But as we move that, that monochromator over and test the different wavelengths, we're getting the different values of red, green, and blue. And what we're essentially doing is mapping out the response of the pigments in our eye. So it's weird. It's like we're taking the spectrum, the absorbance spectrum of the three pigments in our eye. So that's what these observer functions are. These are the observ the are the the way you can tell if uh, you know you have a green pigment in your eye. This is the response of that green pigment or the response of the red pigment. So we're able to map it out and actually detect what's going on in our retinas. I think that is really neat, you know. And so then also the signals. Uh, uh, of another spectrum, like if you put a, an absorbent spectrum in between your eye and the, and the detector, um, between your eye and the source, then you will get um, the response of your eye to this third function. And that's how we get the RGB values or XYZ values. So, so here's crepe paper. You can go to the party store and you can see all the different varieties of crepe paper. I mean, who knows? Maybe there was a murder at a party and you've got crepe paper and it's evidence. So, you know, this is your samples. These are all the crepe paper. Um, and you see that we use the white crepe paper as our standard. So it's 100% all the way across. So it's got that transmittance value of, of one or reflectance value of one. Um, and then you can see the different uh, ones. So the orange is way over here. These gave some beautiful spectra. So you see the orange is is giving us all of the red light and a little bit of the yellow light. So that's that's perceived by us as orange. Yellow, you get all of the red light and, and, and all the way into the yellow and just a hair of the green. And that is perceived as yellow. So like on the computer, if you have the RGB values and you turn the red all the way up and the green all the way up, it'll be yellow. It's so weird because your eye is responding to the red and the green, there's no blue. And so it says, oh, that's yellow. That's the yellow end of the spectrum. Green is a really sensitive one. You see that the reflectance here is not very high at all. So very little light is coming off of that green paper, but your eye is able to detect it. And your eye is probably the most sensitive to green. And then the blue, again, there's there's very little light coming out. You've got just a, this amount of blue reflecting off the surface and you can see it's definitely blue paper. The, the brighter the color, the higher the reflectance. Okay. And look at brown. So this brown paper down here, brown and red are not that different. And here it looks like orange. So brown and orange, but red is just a, like this might be red where it cuts down just a little earlier than the yellow. The only difference between say brown and red is that brown is almost black. So it gets all the way down. It just takes the red all the way down, almost to black. Same with yellow. Pink is not on here, but pink is red and blue. Uh, if it's really pink, then it's way up at the top. If it's purple, then they're both down close to the bottom, but it's the same mix of colors. And so this is, again, this color is, is observed, not absorbed. And so when you have a blue sample, the light, the blue light goes through that sample or is reflected off that sample. So we have transmittance. This is just a review of the different equations that you've had beat into your heads as chemists, right? Transmittance is I over I naught. So it's the light that comes through divided by the, 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 the light that entered the sample. And that's equal to the you know exponent to the minus absorbance unit, okay? And then diffuse reflectance I've drawn this circle here because a lot of times diffuse reflectance is collected using an integrating sphere.
And here the word integrating is used in its mathematical sense. It's like it's integrating the signal at all angles. So it's collecting light at all of the angles and detecting at 90 <laughs> degrees. So there's a little hole right here. So there's a hole here where the light hits the sample. There's a hole here where the light goes in. And the light hits the sample and, and it bounces off at all different angles. And it's going to bounce around in that in that sphere until it finds its way to the exit. Okay, so you put that, it's really cool if you have one of these. We have one in PCHEM lab, but the it's broken. That's why we didn't use it in PCHEM. But you can, uh, when it was working, you turn on the light, and the light's coming straight down. You set that on uh, down out of the sphere and you could look in the side. You set it on a colored object and the inside, the whole inside of that sphere turns the same color as the object it's sitting on. It's really cool. So what you're seeing, if you were if you were down here and you looked up in that cube, in that sphere, you would see bright blue everywhere you looked, because it's coming off of that blue sample, and it's the, all the photons coming off that blue sample going around in that cube coming or that sphere coming out uh, the side are going to be blue. So that's diffuse reflectance. Specular reflectance is it preserves the angle of of incidence. So right here we have this um, normal to the surface. And so this angle is preserved. So that's the difference between the two. And specular reflectance tells you more about the source. So notice here, even though we have a blue object, if this is a, a smooth surface, I'm going to put an arrow there that says that's a smooth surface. And the reason I know it's a smooth surface is because the red and the green come through. It's a blue object. So where'd the red and green come from? They just reflect off the smooth surface and don't interact with the sample. So specular reflectance is not good for determining color if you have a smooth sample because you're really getting more information about the source. And you can see that in here. If, if you were to come up here and look at the countertop, um, I can see white light coming off the countertop, but the countertop is black. So what am I seeing? I'm seeing the source. So at the angle of the lights on the ceiling, I can see their reflection in the surface, and I see white light. So I see all wavelengths of light, even though this the surface is black. Um, at other angles, it's definitely black because I'm not getting a lot of diffuse reflectance off this surface. The rougher the surface, the less specular reflectance you have. So it's kind of a trade-off. You can, if you have a smooth surface, specular reflectance is great for telling you about the source, but not great about telling you about the sample. But if you have a rough surface, you have very little specular reflectance. And most of what you're getting is diffuse reflectance. But they, um, they typically do total reflectance. Let's see, how does it work? They do a difference. Yeah, I think they do this. They have a little over here on the on the, um, the integrating sphere. They have a little thing that that blocks to make sure there's never any kind of specular reflectance coming in. Like maybe there's a tiny little angle to the light, and it can come in here and give you spec spectral specular reflectance. They block that, so they'll do total reflectance, and then they'll block the specular reflectance and uh, get the diffuse reflectance. And so the difference between that is the specular. So uh, I'll say R total is equal to R diffuse plus R spec. And that, that equation is for sure. It's just how they measure it can, can vary based upon the technique. OK, so we have the these tiny little spectrometers, I mean, they're miniaturized now. I've even seen them for sale as USB drives, like they're that small. And they have a little fiber optic that comes out the end. And that's really cool. Um, so you plug it into your laptop and you can walk around and, and get color data, you know, reflectance data um, at the scene if you have a laptop. Okay. You saw our ocean optics spectrometer in PCAM. It's about that big. Runs on a USB power supply. It doesn't have its own power supply. It doesn't even have any moving parts. So this has a source 
goes out the fiber optic, hits the object, comes back through a fiber optic and goes into the spectrometer. The spectrometer just has a, a, a monochrometer or grating and a diode array. And that's it. And no moving parts. So it's really rugged. And they put these things on satellites and shot them up into space. Here's the here's a picture of all of the apparatus. So here's here's the source. The only I mean the reason it's so bulky is because they sort of it's kind of like Tinker Toys. You have all the little pieces. You don't know what Tinker Toys are, do you? You know what Tinker Toys are? It's the, yeah, it's just a bunch of little. It's kind of like Legos. Okay, yeah. So you have the source here. I hated Tinker Toys because they weren't versatile enough. Legos were the way to go. <laughs> so you have the source, you have the fiber optics. This is a nice little thing called an attenuator. It just helps make sure your detector is not saturated. So attenuator. And then the spectrometer over here. And then your different samples. So san attenuator, sample, uh, spectrometer, and then white and black reference standards. So in the freshman chemistry books, you have this little color wheel analysis. And, and we talked about this before with the colorimetry um, that, you know, if it absorbs in the yellow, you're going to see violet. If it absorbs in the red, you're going to see green. But this is this is pretty weak. You know, what if there are two peaks or or their peaks tail the left or the right? And so it's a better color analysis to go through that ASTM standard. So you take your samples, you put them in a visible spectrometer and get a spectrum. And then you take that spectrum through this colorimetric analysis. So we determine those tristimulus values, X, Y, and Z, capital X, Y, and Z. This is case sensitive, which is a little strange. but And then you transform the X, Y, Z into RGB values and then convert them to 8-bit RGB values and you can display them. So this is what we've done here. We've taken the purple, purple solution, the potassium permanganate, gone into the spectrometer, and this is the KMNO4 um, spectrum. Went through this whole analysis and we end up with these RGB values. Okay, so this is the RGB. And then I drew this circle or the square. I can't with circles and squares today. I got through this rectangle and and these are the RGB values. And I typed those in to make the color the same value as those RGB values. And you can see it matches pretty well. So you can compare it to the photograph. So Fantastic color analysis, okay? Now we can, if you take the graduate spectroscopy course, uh, I really have a whole module on how to use Gaussian to produce the simulated spectrum. And then you run the simulated spectrum through this whole thing and you get the color of the molecule that you calculated in Gaussian, which is super fun. Yeah, so we check out, check out the dyes and pigments and so on, and then they do color analysis on it. And, and in most cases, they, the color was uh, was accurate. There was a few weird cases. Don't know what's going on with the weird cases, but the, in general, you, you get some great colors. So this is taken from the uh, ASTM E308. And it's similar to these primary colors, that X, Y, and Z values. Um, we can uh, we can sort of match those those tristimulus uh, values, the, the observer functions to the experimental spectrum. So this is kind of what happens in, in uh, matching the paint. So if we look at this and we see that here's the spectrum, the transmittance spectrum for potassium permanganate, and how would I approximate this curve? Well, I would have a lot of the red. You see this red here? So the red has a little bit of over here, and then it's, it's got a big peak here. So do you see the overlap of these? If I multiply these two functions together, I have non-zero numbers multiplied by non-zero numbers. If I have, like, look at, let's look at the green. The green is here, it's, it peaks here and there. So if I multiply the green peak by that spectrum, what's gonna be the result? I've got zero values for my purple multiplied by non-zero values for the green. So that cancels out the green signal. So I'm just trying to show you a little more depth than what you learned in PCHEM, why this works. So this is telling me I have very little green in, in my results, my experimental spectrum. And it comes just from 
multiplying these functions together and adding up the product. It's a sum product. So I multiply each of the values together. And if I got a lot of zeros, you know, that cancel out numbers that are non-zero, then that sum is going to be really small. But if, if I have non-zero numbers that correspond to non-zero numbers, then that sum is going to be really big. So I'm going to get a big number for the red, a really small number for the green, and then the blue overlaps as well. So that's what we mean by this overlap integral. We have an overlap of the functions. We multiply them together and add them together. That's called an overlap integral. And if they don't overlap, then we have zeros multiplied by non-zero numbers, and they all cancel out. So that's what's going on here. This is the sum product. So we're, we're taking the product of these three functions, and then we're summing them together, and that gives us the x. So the observer, the, the red one, the x value, it's going to be the red, times the source, times the response, which is our experimental spectrum. And then we have a normalization factor here. We're just sort of normalizing it by the response of the green, and that'll be the same in all of them. So this is that overlap integral for the x function, then the overlap integral for the y function, and the overlap integral for the z function. And if the, the non-zero and the zero parts don't line up, then we have a lot of cancellation. If they do line up, then we have a strong overlap, and we get, and so we could do this with any recipe. You know, instead of the pigment functions in our eye, we could use the paint pigments. We could have a hundred of them. And this same math would tell us what relative amounts to put in of each of those pigments. And that's what's going on at Home Depot. So you take in, you know, you scrape a little paint off the wall, take that little swatch in, say I want to match this paint in my kitchen or whatever, and they stick it on there. They, there's a spectrometer in there, and it has the math. It does the same equations. But instead of X, Y, and Z on the far right, it's all their pigments. And so it'll say, put in two ounces of pigment number five and 15 ounces of this and mix it in this base. The base would be that, that illumination, the center number, and it would give you a perfect match. That's why it's so good. Now they give you uh, like the, the multiple recipes, they just pick the best one. But if they were out of one of those pigments, they could scroll down and see if they could get that same color out of a different recipe. And so then you've seen the big carol, they switch it around, they have your gown, they, they like move the mark up and they squirt a certain amount of this color and a certain amount of that color and then they put it on the shaker. As a kid, I loved the shaker. It was loud and scary. You know, like that. And so this, uh, these XYZ values were not very useful for electronics. And so Apple and Adobe and Microsoft and all of them in 93 said, let's, let's come up with an actual scheme for taking these XYZ values and converting them into RGB values. And so they came up with this matrix that we used in PCAM. So if we have those XYZ values, this color consortium uh, came up with this standard matrix. So they determined this matrix. So that is the matrix for converting XYZ values over to RGB values. And it's still roughly on a scale of zero to one. And so we, that's not very useful for the computer. So then we multiply those by whatever bit depth we have in terms of our, our computer code. Most of our computer code for colors is eight bits on each of the RGB values. So a 24 bit color. And so then we can, we can take that and convert it. Let's see. I think I have it in the spreadsheet. So, so once we convert that to zero to 255, then we can display it on the projector, display it on the screen. We can print it out. And that's really what the point of the color consortium was, is this device independent standard. So if you really get into this in terms of your forensic analysis in the future, um, they're gonna have to spend a lot more to get calibrated devices. So if this was the projector in the courtroom and I wanted to make sure that it produced the colors that the standard uh, called out for, I would have to have a projector that had color profiles so that when it puts the color of potassium permanganate on the screen, that when I send it those RGB values, it's the right color. And that gets into the mechanics of the device itself. How is it projecting the color? And then the same for the screen and then the same for my printers. If I'm gonna print something out for the jury, I need to make sure that printer is an accurate printer because I don't want them saying, 
in you know the witness saying it was it was uh i don't know puce <laughs> whatever and like we figure out what that number is or whatever or they say they say it's red and then they look at their printout and it's a faded printer and it looks pink and like well they said this is red this is clearly not red well that's an artifact of the printer not the evidence and not the data so so this color is really much more important than than you might imagine if, if um you know if there's a disagreement then uh, it, it, it may just be perception so we need to get it uh, quantified. And so then we can also convert these tristimulus values to the lowercase x and y. The lowercase z is not used, but it's just the scaling x by the sum of all the values and y by the sum of all the values, and you end up with these chromaticity coordinates. And so you've seen this diagram before, and and these are the um, uh, these are the the values of those cuvettes. So this was the methyl red. This was the potassium permanganate. This was the copper sulfate. And this was the nickel, nickel chloride. Thank you. And methyl red's an organic compound. I don't know what, what it is, but I have to look it up. And then this was the water. Now, there's a limit to what our eyes can perceive. So there's going to be some region in here that is sort of the maximum. I'll just draw a triangle like this. And that's called the color gamut. And that color gamut, you have one for your eyes. You also have a color gamut for any device. So the pigments in the printer ink or the projector, the whatever filters they have using for the for the light in that projector or the screen, the phosphors on my screen, those have different compounds that produce different wavelengths of light. And they're not going to be able to get all of the colors. And and what's weird about that is is what it's really I think hard to conceptualize if you look at these wavelengths of light, this is 700 nanometers right here. This is 400 nanometers down here. And notice how the spectrum goes all the way around. So this is the visible spectrum covering the whole color gamut all the way around here to 700. And so like if you're at 530, you're right there. But there, at least in theory, are some regions here which you cannot distinguish between. So your eye might stop right there and not be able to tell the difference between 530 and 532. Okay, There may actually be a difference in color, but your color gamut for your eye just can't see it. Okay, They also can, can detect with the maximum and min on the knobs, like I was saying, these uh, similarity or uh, ellipses. And so they can draw little ellipses here. Let's see, I'm thinking it's blue that is really small. And red is pretty big, I believe. Okay. So like your uncertainty might be larger in the red colors than it is in the blue colors. And so those are, um, they've sort of mapped out with lots of different people doing those measurements, sort of what the differences are. And when you're arguing over this small difference in RGB values, you're arguing about nothing because nobody can tell the difference between plus or minus 10 uh, units in that RGB value. So, so this is the analysis we did at PCAM. Here's all of the different uh, crepe papers. We reduce that data to every five nanometers as required by, that, by the standard. And then we compare those to the observer functions, which are also every five nanometers. We did the, the transformation matrix and, and we converted that to um, the standard RGB values. And here's the little spreadsheet that we have. Now, the nice thing about this, I'll, I'll zoom in. Um, we can see that um, we have these color swatches down here and we have these standard RGB values converted to 8-bit. And so we can see the colors that we have and we can there's some if-then statements you can put in. 
and the correction for CRT monitors. I won't go into that because I try to find one nowadays. Um, and then displaying the RGB value. So this is old school Windows here, but you, you pick on the, the object, double click or right click, or somehow get to where you're modifying the colors and you can put in the standard RGB values. So from the Excel analysis, you can pick an object on the screen and make that color the, the standard RGB values. Again, if you're presenting evidence, you've got a, a spectrum of the object, like a fiber or a paint chip, and you, you've got the reflectance spectrum. Wouldn't it be nice to show a color swatch of that color? Okay. And so you could go ahead and do this analysis on your reflectance spectrum and display the RGB value for that, for that object. And you could compare it to the image. Now in image, J, this is a great uh, package because it's free. You can have really expensive image analysis software, uh, but there's, because this was produced with a, a government grant, an NIH grant for analyzing uh, microscopic images, they put the source code up on, on the internet and you can download it, you can run it on your machine. And, and the, because it's a free Java-based uh, package, a lot of people can write plugins. And so there's particle analysis plugins. There's um, probably cross-sectional you know, area plugins. There's all kinds of add-on software that you can get. And I'm sure some of it is forensic related. And so if you select an area, see the problem if you go into the image and say Windows, and, and try to find the RGB values, it's typically wherever the mouse is. Like when you have the little um, dropper tool, like you want to match a color, the little dropper tool, it's a single pixel. And that's not very useful. You'd like to get an area. So look how pixelated this image is. It's kind of a trash image, I admit that. But that's okay, this is helpful for our purposes. I drew this yellow box and selected all of that red region and then I come up to analyze tools, color histogram, and here are all of the pixels in that box, the RGB values. And, and the, um, you know, the, the mode is that, that maximum value in this distribution. So like this little value right there, that little value right there, and that little value right there is the mode. And so that's the RGB results. So that's the most frequent pixel color in that little that little area and so this would be 169.030 so that would be for my methyl red i could report from the image that that is the color of that of that cuvette and then i went through the spectrometer uh, and got the standard rgb values and you can compare those so from image analysis we have these rgb values here so these are from image analysis and then the, the others are from, are from the spectroscopy. And they're pretty close. You see they have the same pattern, 0, 01672, 0, 02085. You say, well, they're not the same. But perceptually, you really can't tell the difference. Okay. And you can see that in this next image, right? Up here, these, these were the pictures. These are the RGB values of the pictures. And here's the color swatches. So you decide, do those color swatches accurately predict the color of what's in the cuvettes, even with kind of a degraded image? Yeah, I would say it captures it pretty well. So this would be the color of the copper sulfate, the potassium permanganate, the nickel chloride, the methyl red. And it's nice to be able to show a nice clean panel that has that color, especially if you're gonna compare it, say, you know, suspect and, and seen evidences. Okay. And of course, these pictures are taken with a $30 webcam, you know, piece of junk webcam. Yeah. But again, it's, 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 a, it's a great sort of analysis to show that you can take those, those regions and, and come up with decent RGB values. And then you can take them through a spectrometer and get rock solid RGB values. Okay, so here's that color gamut for the computer. That's the RGB color gamut. So even though I show colors outside of that triangle, that they're, they're really not able to even be displayed on a computer. Like there may be a color here, but it's outside the color gamut of the computer. So I couldn't show it even if I wanted to. That's kind of weird. 
and I mean, could I perceive it? Maybe. Like I might be able to say that real object and the computer just never look the same. And it's because the real object color is a green that the computer just can't display. So there are limits to computers or displays or what have you. Here's all of the different names of the colors, which again is just drives me crazy. But like if you look down in here, it's kind of hard for even me to see on my own monitor. But you have pink and purplish pink and purplish red and red purple and orange and reddish orange, yellow green, yellowish green, <laughs> green, <laughs> bluish green, greenish blue. And, and so, um, you know, all the crepe papers are on here, all the different samples that we've looked at so far. Here's your illuminous, uh, your illumination profiles. Look at this little line here. So if we were to display the color of all the sources, you see A shows up at 2850. I said around 3000 Kelvin. Uh, B was 4,800 or close to 5,000 Kelvin. C or the D65 was 6,500 Kelvin. And so it goes through the white point and gets into the blue region when you get to 6,500. Here's those uncertainty ellipses that I was talking about. See the green uncertainty ellipse is huge. The red is smaller than the green one. And then the blue is really tiny. So this is telling us our eyes are really sensitive the changes in the blue part of the spectrum. And then we have the other color spaces, the Munsell color system, the LAB color system. There are ways to convert from one to the other. It's not easy though. I was gonna look that up for this class and it, it got real deep when I was reading about it. So uh, if you have to do that, great those software that they, they make, they will do that. <laughs> okay. um, you can also cheat and use Windows. So sometimes in the packages, you can set the RGB values. And then on a different tab, it'll be LAB. And so you set the RGB values and switch over to the other tab, and it'll be the, the LAB values. So it's built into the software, and you can use it that way. So hue is the color. Uh, lightness is sort of brightness and chroma is how strong the color is, how far away it is from gray. And then we talked about the Munsell system uh, where you have all of the different um, values like RP would be red purple, you know, YR is yellow red, and then you go around and you have uh, really, really uh, bright light pastel colors in the middle, really saturated or dark um, colors farther out. And then we get into forensic photography. Uh, if illumination is important for color perception and like geometry, like how you're observing it is important, and then your detector is important, you have all three of those things in your camera. So you've got to figure out, it's got to be well illuminated. So you have to have either a flash, diffuse flash, some way of illuminating it in a standard way. And you've got to be, you know, the distance to the object is important. And then the white balance or software on the camera side is really important. You know, there's all kinds of settings on the camera that, that can correct for fluorescent lights or daylight or cloudy day. Um, and so you gotta make sure you, you, you lock all of that down and you do it the same way every time once you get it dialed in to uh, a, a setting that reproduces the color well. So they have these, uh, these cards that you put in the scene of the of the image so you have evidence you know number it's good to have a scale marker sometimes these little evidence cards will have a scale marker on there so that you can scale the evidence and then it's really good to have uh, some color card color swatches in there and a grayscale. so all of these things are fantastic for calibrating your images you know if you print it out and it's uh the printout isn't great you can tell because the the black uh, fully saturated black might not be fully black on the printout. And so you would know that you, you've got a, the image is too bright because the black is not black. Or maybe everything's too dark and you know, you're supposed to be here at 50% black and it's already white. So then your, your ink is really light or your printout is really light. So the grayscale is important. The color is important. Maybe you've got some uh, issue with uh, with red or yellow. Maybe you've got the setting on the camera wrong where now the, the white looks yellow and it should look white. So 
you can detect a lot of anomalies with your photograph if you have a color swatch in this in the picture. If you don't, you can't detect them. And then there's this difference between additive and subtractive color. So monitors and projectors are using additive color. So if they project red, green, and blue all on the same spot, it'll come out white because they're sending light out there. And, and you add those photons together. And when you, when you see them with your eye, you detect all three. And so you see that as a white light. In, in terms of ink, a toner, paint, it's subtractive. And so if they put a yellow pigment, a red pigment, and a blue pigment all on the same spot, it's black because it's absorbing all of the other colors. And if you overlap all of those, then it's black. So that's called subtractive color. And the mixing of red, green, and blue doesn't produce a really good black. And so for, for accurate printing, they add the fourth, which is just carbon black toner. So CMYK, the C is cyan, which is the, the blue color. So that one, yeah, well, you got the letter CMYK and K is black. And so you see how this isn't quite black, so they would, they would add extra. To make sure that if it's supposed to be black, then it really is black. Now there's some misconceptions with these colorants. Like a lot of times people think a dye and a pigment are two different things, but no, it can be the same substance. And it's just depending upon whether it's soluble in the solvent or not. So if it's acting like a dye, that means it's dissolved in the solvent. What's the difference between dissolution and suspension? Well, so something that's suspended is not, uh, I would say, on a molecular basis. Like, uh, think of, think of like a, a salt crystal. When it dissolves, every little ion is pulled apart. And so you just have ions in solution. You could suspend that salt crystal and then you have ions still clustered together. So little clusters of that molecule are suspended. So that would be a pigment. If each molecule is independently surrounded by solvent, then it's a dye. So that's the difference. It's how, it, how, it, how it's soluble in the carrier or not. So if it's on a molecular basis or an, a cation anion basis that completely dissolved, then it's a dye. If it's small particles, then it's a pigment. So a molecule can be either either a dye or a pigment based upon the solvent. And then, of course, we went through the color classifications when we did the spot tests for drugs analysis. Um, we had the different azo dyes and so on. Um, so how would we classify these colorants? We could also classify them, whether they're soluble in water or not, whether they're ionic or not, whether they're derived from a natural substance or not. Um, we could also, if they're, say, an organic molecule, a synthetic compound, we would have maybe a cast number. So you could find that specific substance using the chemical abstract number. And then there's also a color index number uh, maintained by some of these organizations that deal with color. And so you've seen some of these classifications like pigment red 48. Well, it'll have this color index number, and then you could look that up in their catalog. We also um, we would dye or you know dissolve these or suspend these colored molecules in carrier solvents for printing. Um, there's you know inks and toners and paints are incredibly complex. Uh, some of these are, are really fascinating. Like you have a, a particle that you have suspended in order to keep that in solution and keep it from settling out. You want it to be charged, and you put a surfactant in there that neutralizes the charge, and you have sort of a positive particle, a negative ring of surfactant around that, and then positive charges around that. And so the whole particle is suspended by, by electric charge. If it tries to get close to another particle to settle out, the surface of those little um, domains is the same charge, and so they, they keep, keep away from each other. So there's a lot more that goes into it than you might imagine. Uh, we also, with these charges, we can create static electricity with these particles. And so that's how the copiers work. They have this, this, um, this uh, drum that has an image printed on it in static charge. And then the, the toner sticks to that drum with static charge and then gets real close to the paper and transfers to the paper. 
And so that, that powder is just lightly on the paper. And then we run it through a hot zone that fuses it to the paper. So it kind of melts that particle waxy substance and it sticks to the cellulose and comes out hot. You feel that it's hot. That's the fuser. And when you have a jam and the paper hasn't been through the fuser yet, you can see how easy it is to remove the toner. So there's, a, there's like a laser that goes across the paper that creates a static charge on this drum. The drum picks up the toner, rubs it on the paper, and then the paper goes through a fuser and it fuses it. And I mean, it is a lot of technology and I'm amazed that it can do it in you know, like a third of a second. I mean, some of these things really crank out the copiers. I mean, copies, and it's just, I don't know, the technology is incredible. But you can imagine how uh, specific all of those components would be to, say, a manufacturer. Like, they have their drum configuration, and they have their toner, and they, you know, so this, again, would be evidence that you might have in telling the difference between a Ricoh copier or a Xerox. Uh, for paint... This latex binder, you know, the original latex would be from a tree, like a rubber tree. They put a steel in there and it drips out the sap and then the water evaporates and you're left behind with this natural rubbery substance that will polymerize. And we're going to talk about that in that recorded lecture next Tuesday um, in terms of polymerization. And, and this, so that's where the word latex came from. This water-based uh, fatty molecules that can polymerize and make a, make a polymer. Okay, so then you mix in the pigments and all kinds of other uh, substances. You spread it on the surface. The water evaporates. Uh, light hits it, starts this polymerization reaction, and it forms a, a plastic coating that has a, has a color to it. And then automotive paint, because it's going to be out in the weather, it's going to be uh, hit with tiny rocks and sand and stuff like that, rain all kinds of things. They have a lot of coats on there to make a really hard coating. So you have the, the, the metal, you have some sort of primer. Sometimes you have multiple primers, and then you might have metal flakes and a clear coat and different colors. And so how do we analyze these things? Well, a lot of times, if you need to analyze paint still on the car, they'll grind it. They'll get a grinder and they'll cut a diagonal mark through there. Like they'll, they'll grind it down to the base metal. Now that's not great if, the, if you're the car owner <laughs> because they're rubbing the paint off all the way down to the metal, but they're, they're rubbing it off so that they can analyze all the different layers. And so you can think about a, a cone cut out of your paint. You're going to have a ring of the base coat. You have a ring of primer one, a ring of primer two, and a ring of the color and a ring of the clear coat. And you could get on there with a fiber optic spectrometer and you could take reflectance spectra of all of those different coats. We could also uh, take a paint chip and stick it into uh, like a plastic housing, melt the plastic, and then cut it cross section and get in there with a, an ATR. Now we have uh, an ATR microscope upstairs in my lab that has an 80 micron spot size. So if these layers are 80 microns or larger, I can actually touch it with that ATR and get an infrared spectrum of it. Um, we can also hit it with a uh, uh, you know, visible light and look at the reflectance spectrum in the visible region. And so those are all kinds of things. Forensic photography, we talked a little bit about microspectroscopy. And uh, Dr. Lewis, next Thursday, will give you a lot of information on microspectrophotometry. She did an UV, Viz, and she even did Raman through the microscope. So you'll see some Raman spectra too, I hope.